Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, a philanthropic community partner since 1922, and a proud supporter of numerous community organizations. More information at smithville.com. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. We are out of the studio and on the road, and we're beginning our tank trip at the world's largest sycamore stump and the world's largest steer. Where in Indiana could we possibly be? Only Kokomo, the city of firsts. Join us at the Kokomo Automotive Museum, the Cyberling Mansion, the Kokomo Opalescent Glass Factory, and Artworks and the Art Alley. All this and more here in Kokomo, right now on the weekly special. Welcome to the weekly special, I'm Erica Sagone. We're here in Kokomo, which is known as the City of Firsts. It got its name because of all the innovation that's happened here over the years. We're gonna start with a look back at Elwood Haynes, a pioneer in the automotive industry. A lot of people don't realize, but Indiana sits atop what was a, a massive natural gas deposit. It went into Illinois, Eastern Illinois, and Western Ohio. So this was a massive natural resource. The discovery of this deposit more than 150 years ago gave rise to an industrial Kokomo, and it meant that work and the opportunity for innovation was plentiful. In 1891, a gentleman named Elwood Haynes came from Portland, Indiana. He was college educated, and he'd, he'd been a metallurgist. He's quite the genius. He also designed and built one of the earliest automobiles made in the United States. It's very simple. He needed a way to get to the gas fields. And the only way to do that was this new thing, the automobile, which didn't even, didn't even have the name automobile. In fact, if you read some of the older literature, they refer to it as a motorcycle, or a horse's carriage, things like that. But the automobile term was not in common usage. The need may have been simple, but the build was anything but. Haynes sourced a gasoline engine, cutting edge technology for the time, from Michigan, and then set out to convince the Apperson brothers, Edgar and Elmer, to help him build his horseless carriage. Saying something like that in 1893 would be about like to saying today, you know, I want to build a rocket that will go to Mars, and I want you to build it for me. People are going to look at you like you're a little bit off. Mr. Haynes must have been a pretty good salesman because the car, later known as the Pioneer, was built. He eventually gets $1,000 wrapped up in this thing, which to give you an idea, the average person in the 1880s and 90s the average worker was making 300 bucks a year. So that was a lot of money. They take the better part of a year and they test run it July 4th, 1894 on an old road called Pumpkin Vine Pike, brings it back into town at seven miles per hour. By modern standards, it had a few issues. It didn't have braking capacity, it was very good. It had no reverse and had no muffler. And the steering was a crank that you kind of, like you pushed it this way you pushed it, pulled it that way to steer, it didn't work very well. For 1894, it was a marvel. Haynes continued to innovate, improved his original design, and soon built a factory in Kokomo. The factory, with precision tools and electric power, was one of the first in the world to produce cars and was a revelation for its day. You look at the production time, it goes from being like a whole year down to like six, eight months, and by, by 1897, we are incorporating and we're building several cars a year. It shows that there's a, there's a market for them, for one thing, because they wouldn't build them if they couldn't sell them. There's 30 cars built by 1899, and then it gets to be two and 300 cars and 400 cars. So it shows there's a market for that. There was also very stiff competition. By 1912, Elwood Haynes was largely out of the car business, having returned to his first love, metallurgy. The last Haynes automobile rolled off the line in 1925 the same year its namesake passed away. 
But Kokomo's ties to the automobile didn't end with Haynes and the Apperson brothers. Delco's radio division set up shop in the late 1930s, and two decades later, Chrysler opened its first transmission plant. Today, more than 10,000 Hoosiers have jobs in Kokomo related in some way to the automobile industry. And a trip to the Kokomo Automotive Museum allows visitors to get up close and personal with the city's history. Well, you hear a lot from people who come to the museum. I remember that car. My mom had this, my dad had this. That was my first car. That was, I took my prom date in the, to the prom in that car. Whatever. It's that connection. We owe a lot to the Pioneer Auto Club for, for starting this. And they donated hundreds of thousands of dollars of their time and labor to build this thing. And then they brought their cars in uh, as a way you know, to, to fill it. And some of these cars are still here. There are, not surprisingly, a number of Haynes cars. It's the largest collection in the world. and includes a replica of the Haynes Pioneer. The original sits in the Smithsonian. We have uh, an Apson Jackrabbit. That I call it a 19-teens Corvette. We have uh, a 1923 uh, Haynes Model 75 touring car. It was owned by one of the founders of the museum. It is a typical 1920s touring car. It's large, maroon, what was black, and it's a gorgeous machine. It has a presence. There are Coles, Cords, and Duesenbergs, Studebakers, Model Ts, and GTOs. If you're a car enthusiast or an amateur historian, there's something here for you. The goal of the museum is to celebrate the city of firsts, from Elwood Haynes to today. Without Kokomo, we wouldn't have this. Without Kokomo, we wouldn't have that. Oh my goodness. Suddenly, it becomes, well, maybe there's something to that place. Maybe there is something to that place. Maybe it's, it's more than just some of the old industrial town. Whatever city you live in, or whatever city you, you're passing through, you get to know that history, you begin to appreciate what it was and what, how it affects you and it affects things today. Don't miss your opportunity to see these beautiful cars up close. Get hours and directions to the Kokomo Automotive Museum at kokomoautomotivemuseum.com. Elwood Haynes wasn't the only industrialist to put down roots in Kokomo. In 1889, another ambitious entrepreneur built this Cyberling Mansion. And now it's an icon here in Kokomo. If you love to poke around old houses like I do, you're in luck. Let's head inside. We're here with Dave Broman. He's the executive director of the Howard County Historical Society, which oversees the Cyberling Mansion. Dave, thank you so much for having us here today. Welcome to the Cyberling. What a beautiful house. Yes, absolutely. I'd like for you to give us an idea of sort of the historical significance of this mansion. You know, why is it here in the first place? It really goes back to the Indiana gas boom of the mid-1800s when they discovered natural gas. And at that time, this was an agricultural community and they brought in industry because of the natural gas. They were giving away free gas to people who had come in and built factories. So one of the very first to use that on a large scale industrial manufacturing basis throughout Indiana was a guy named Monroe Cyberling. He came to Kokomo and built a couple of different factories. He had plenty of money, so he built this gorgeous house. Wonderful. And you know, the Historical Society, along with the county, has been restoring this mansion since about the 1970s. Give us an idea of what the restoration and the preservation um, of this beautiful house has been like. It's been an ongoing process. We've actually had to do it in a series of stages, which began around 1971, 72, with simply stabilizing the structure because it had been sitting empty for a few years and had unfortunately deteriorated quite a bit. So we just had to make sure the roof was intact and clean up some of the residue from the birds and the broken windows and things like that. And then we could begin to move the museum in. And then over the course of the next few years, we had a major renovation in 88, we had one about 2002, and, uh, and then we, the most recently we just did some uh, roof work. One really neat point in the mansion's past is that it actually used to house Indiana University Kokomo. Can you tell us a little bit about that? You bet. Um, the house was a residence for the Cyberling family for a few years before they moved on. They, they built this gorgeous house, in, uh, finished in 1891, and in 1895 they left. 
the GI Bill was expanding college enrollment across the country, and Indiana University in particular was growing by leaps and bounds and establishing branch campuses. Kokomo's enrollment had exploded, they needed more room, and the house was available. So they bought it from the estate of the previous owner, and they turned this into a university. Wow, what a neat opportunity for students. I can't imagine having class in some of these gorgeous rooms. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and they had classes, they had dances, they had sock hops, the uh, student union was in the basement of all places, and uh, it's kinda neat. After building this you know, beautiful house, the Cyberlings did not stay here very long. Why not? He was an industrial entrepreneur. He was a guy who built things. He uh, came from that background in Ohio in the Akron area. He came over here specifically to take advantage of the gas boom and build factories. So his glass company in Kokomo was taken over by a big syndicate from out east. And he moved on to Illinois to build several more factories in the Peoria and Ottawa. The mansion is kind of a mix of um, exhibits and sort of preservation, and it's open to the public, of course. Um, when people come here, what should they not miss? The woodwork is stunning, and I love watching people's mouths drop when they walk in the front door. The woodwork, the stained glass windows are absolutely gorgeous. The natural gas brought a lot of glass manufacturing to central Indiana, not just here, but in Madison County, you know, Elwood, Anderson, clear up to uh, Hartford City. Uh, one of the glass companies that came in was Kokomo Opalescent Glass, and they manufacture art glass, which is colored glass for stained glass windows. Uh, in fact, they manufactured quite a bit of glass for Tiffany and company. So they were here when Cyberlink came, making glass, and they made the glass and the windows for this beautiful mansion. We have a few windows that are, that are reproductions, but we actually have a number of original stained glass windows with that original opalescent glass in them. They're gorgeous. What exactly is the architectural style of this home? The official name is Neo-Jacobian Romanesque Revival. Now, I'm not an architect and can't talk a whole lot about that. It's primarily Romanesque revival, uh, which is characterized by the heavy stone blocks that are around the house. It gives it a really solid built feature feeling when you, when you look at the house. It's a big stone brick Romanesque. Well, in addition to being a lovely home, this is also a county museum with exhibits. Tell us about some of the exhibits that you'll find here. Well, we try to go through and explain the founding of the county and really focus on the gas boom history because that's what made Kokomo what it is today. So we have, in the inside the house, we have a mix of exhibits and period rooms to let people get an idea of what it was like to live here and then to also understand how the community came to be, how the county came to be what it is today. And as you mentioned before, at one point the house was in such disrepair that some might have wondered, why not just tear it down? Why save it? Why is this house important to Kokomo and maybe important to Indiana? It, obviously it's an architectural beauty. It, it's just one of those iconic buildings that has come to stand for not only the commu this community, but this whole, this whole county. But beyond that, it has a tremendous symbolic value because it represents the huge change that made Kokomo the industrial town that it is. This building is at the core of why this town is what it is. We're certainly fortunate to have this wonderful home here as a peek into Indiana's past. Thank you, Dave, for giving us a tour um, of the home and its history. My pleasure. Thank you. And if you would like more information on the Cyberling Mansion or the Howard County Museum, visit their website, howardcountymuseum.org. Well, as Dave mentioned, the Cyberling Mansion is full of glass from the Kokomo Opalescent Glass Factory. It's a business that's over 100 years old, and we're going to take you there right now to learn more about its fascinating history. When Kokomo speculators discovered natural gas in 1886, news traveled quickly from Kokomo all the way to New Rochelle, New York, where Charles Edward Henry, a successful glass chemist, saw an opportunity one that would begin a 130-year-old legacy known today as the Kokomo Opalescent Glass Factory. He had already had some connections in the industry, including uh, Lewis Comfort Tiffany. Tiffany was looking for some unique glasses, things with texture, little flaws in them that added character and, and gave the glass a certain look. 
and Henry was willing to provide that. When he heard about the Indiana gas boom, he decided to come over to Indiana because what better place to have a glass factory if you can have free natural gas. And the city of Kokomo actually gave him this property. And so then he erected the original furnace room and uh, started manufacturing this glass. On November 16th of 1888, Henry shipped his first haul of glass, over 600 pounds of brilliant blue and white sheets to Louis Tiffany. Shortly thereafter, Henry also shipped glass to display at the Paris Exposition, a world's fair where he won a gold medal. New orders poured in from across Europe. We're famous for our colors, the, the vibrance of the colors, the richness and the density of the colors. I think maybe at the, prior to Henry, the look for stained glass, people wanted to see it clear and flat and flawless. And, you know, producing a textured stained glass was something that was new and different. Despite the surge of success, Henry's poor financial management led to bankruptcy within the year. But the Kokomo community band together to save the factory. Three local businessmen purchased opalescent glassworks, and over the next century, the families built a glass empire. Kokomo's glass can be seen across the world, from architectural wonders like the Chicago Cultural Center and Frank Lloyd Wright's Dana House, to stunning places of worship like the Air Force Academy's Cadet Chapel and even the Vatican. In fact, there are estimates that 75% of the world's churches contain Kokomo's opalescent glass. Today, it is the oldest stained glass manufacturer in the country. So we make our product just like we did back in 1888. The process has not changed, and we're using the same recipes that we did in his day. We melt the glass the same way we did. We hand ladle it, we hand mix it, and roll it. It's all essentially the exact same. And the thing that's unique about that is no two sheets of glass are going to be identical. Each one is going to be a unique piece of art. And because of this approach, the Kokomo Opalescent Glass Factory is able to offer 22,000 different combinations of color and texture. The furnace's 12 crucibles can each hold a different color of molten glass, up to 600 pounds at a time. It takes half a day for the mixture to melt, but when the glass is ready to be poured, the crew leap into action, quickly ladling their assigned color of molten glass and carrying it to the mixing table. And that is an art form, more than a science. It takes a lot of years and uh, a good eye to know when you've got the appropriate mix. You don't want to overmix it because it'll become muddy, and you don't want it to undermix it because then you'll have the colors segregated where you want them combined together in just the right amount. When the mix is ready, specialized rollers flatten it into a sheet, and the sheet is pushed into an annealing furnace. There, the glass is gradually cooled to prevent cracks. Once the sheet reaches the trim room, it is ready to be cut into the necessary sizes. All told, the factory produces between 1,500 and 2,500 square feet of unique glass each day. We started out strictly as a manufacturer of stained glass sheet and selling that to glass artists around the world. And over the years, uh, we've expanded. Uh, back in the 90s, we added the hot glass studio where we have glass blowers on staff and they produce really an unlimited number of products there. Uh, rondelles are a common product for us. We probably produce more of those than anything, but we also do vases, bowls, paperweights, you name it. If it's made out of colored glass, we're probably doing it somewhere in this factory. And the resident artists are eager to share their passion for glass, offering art classes and opening up the factory floor each weekday morning where visitors can step back in time and watch the century-old process take place, all in the same facility that Charles Henry once built. You can't help but feel that connection to the past and the importance of this place to the community and the people here. You know, we have employees here who are multi-generational in their seniority. We have uh, people that'll come in and tell us that, you know, their grandfather worked here. And it's, uh, it's really neat when, when we have those uh, kind of stories come about, so. 
were part of the industrial heritage of not just Kokomo, but Indiana and the United States. We're one of just a small handful of manufacturers producing glass this way. The glass art community worldwide relies on us to continue in business and be able to supply their needs. You know, there's a lot of things, a lot of new things to try here. Uh, we're constantly developing and, and improving uh, what we do and adding new products. And it's just never ending, the potential of things you can do with glass. And it's very rewarding that way. You can take a tour of the Kokomo Opalescent Glass Factory and see up close how they've made their quality glass for over 100 years. Learn more at KOG.com. When it comes to artistry, the glass company has been helping to make a name for Kokomo for decades. Up next, we're going to take a look at the Kokomo Art Association, which is ensuring that Kokomo is a place for artists for years to come with public works like the Kokomantis. Let's learn more. Kokomo Art Association was established in 1926, so we've been here 92 years now, and we're, I think, the oldest operating art association in Kokomo. The mission was to bring art to the community and the community to art. In 1988, the organization opened the Kokomo Art Center to both house and share the association's extensive art collection. Still, the organization wanted to do more to support its community. So they started to look for a second home where local artists could both showcase and sell their original work. We decided that we liked the vision that the mayor had for the city of making downtown a arts district and we thought this was the place that we should be. And when we walked in the door of this building and saw the staircase and saw the building, we thought this is it. And in 2012, thanks to a gracious benefactor, the Kokomo Arts Association was able to purchase the building. Today, the Artworks Gallery features studio spaces for classes and displays for local artists, cultivating a creative environment for all ages and ability. When you first come in as a new artist, you come in and being around other artistic people, you learn and you absorb and you become a better artist. I've become a better photographer just by being in the Artworks Gallery. Every month here we have a feature or a guest artist and we try to bring in artists from the community but also from outside the community. We've had artists from Chicago, Cincinnati, and we try to bring in things that people here in Kokomo would not normally see. And if some residents weren't going to visit the gallery, then the Kokomo Arts Association would bring the gallery to them. With the help of the city and local volunteers, the organization converted the pedestrian walkway outside their building into a 24-7 outdoor exhibit, aptly named Artist Alley. It's the association's hope that the gallery will transform far more than brick walls. The heart of a city is the downtown, and to have a vibrant city, you have to have a vibrant downtown. It's amazing to walk through the alley and see other people walk, and they are looking at the art and reading the description of the art and enjoying what we have out here. It's wonderful. And there again, we're reaching people. We're bringing art to the community, and you can see it. You can see the people and how they enjoy, and it makes them happy. And seeing that joy inspired the association to bring even more art into the community, partnering with other Kokomo organizations and local artists to create incredible murals dotting the town's walking trails and businesses. When we do these murals, people stop, and they love it, and they they tell you what they think of the mural, they want to know if you're going to do more, and the people are just excited to see these pieces of artwork go up. I think it brightens the community. I think it gives people, when they see it, I think it gives them a little bit of happiness for the day, or it brings a smile to their face to see the art around town. I hope it brings pride to people that, that their community is trying to beautify the places that they walk and sit and see every day. I hope people have pride in that. I, I know I do, but I hope it's an enjoyment and brings a little sense of what art is and what it does for your life. 
I want us to have a legacy of art in the community, and I hope we continue to. There are many wonderful artists in the city, and the Kokomo Art Association is dedicated to bringing them to the community. Find out how you can see their work at kaaonline.org. There are so many things to do and see in Kokomo, with new attractions emerging every year. Discover the city of firsts. Learn more at visitkokomo.org. Well, that's all the time that we've got for tonight. We hope that you've enjoyed journeying to Kokomo with us and discovering all the innovations and ideas that got their start right here. Good night. Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, fiber internet, HD, and digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. The Al Cobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Al Cobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you.